This isn't the usual insane comedy video you've come to know and love over here. There's only one way to really say this stuff. And I'm not the console hacking storyteller guy. <laughs> I'm just a fan of modern retro systems because I like to have freedom on my consoles. The true talent is the people that made this stuff accessible to end users like me. So let's do it. The Nintendo Wii was always one of my favorite consoles, not just for its insanely underrated library and support from Nintendo, but for a different reason, which doesn't get the support from Nintendo, the homebrew channel. I've mentioned it a few times here and there, but I imagine only a small portion of the 100 million owners of a Wii actually use the homebrew channel or even know what it's about or what it's for and what it's capable of. It sounds like I'm the homebrew channel. Only a few people know what I'm capable of. Therapists and doctors say pieces of rubber on a corner of tables is for my own safety. The gaming community always want what's best for their systems where console developers don't always see eye to eye with the community. The relationship is very one-sided, especially with Nintendo. Microsoft realized the power of the homebrew community and designed something called Microsoft XNA, which is a freeware software that lets a developer make games at home. Axiom Verge is a game you might know when it uses its engine. Bastion 2. This is basically Microsoft's way of allowing homebrew on their systems with obvious limitations. I had not heard of this until researching it for this video, but was amazed by it. And I would love to see a history from it from someone who's experienced it firsthand. Maybe I'll do it. NOT! <laughs> to enable homebrew on your console, it was a long journey. Today, it's fairly simple to install, but to get there, the beginning started with a pair of tweezers. That's how most important journeys started. The start of my life started with tweezers too. Or was that forceps? <laughs> but I can't pretend to even begin to understand the complexity of what happened there. So I would strongly recommend checking out Modern Vintage Gamers video about it. It's the talented people like him and the hackers that make me feel like even I have a comprehension of this stuff because they make it accessible to everyone in the community. The goal of the homebrew channel was pretty much exactly what it says on the tin. It wanted to enable you to run unofficial software otherwise known as homebrew. This could be homemade games or programs. As with hacking a console, a developer doesn't want the customer to do it and will constantly update the system to prevent it. The Wii was no stranger to updates and Nintendo would make patches deliberately targeting these exploits that enabled homebrew installation. With hacking consoles, there can be various ways to do it from hardware mods to software mods, with the intention being to get past a security lockout of some sort. A hardware mod usually requires opening up the console and soldering a chip or altering a board in some way, but there are other types of hardware mods that can be done. On the PS1, there's a method that doesn't require any permanent alterations to boot backups, just a spring or a piece of blue tack on the button at the back with a few time swaps and that's it, security evaded well and truly. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, I think I used a little bit too much blue tech. With American N64s to play non-American games, you either change the back plate of the cartridge or remove the two tabs from inside the cartridge bay on the console. And that's it, it fits as good as OJ's gloves. Oh, I messed up, I put two face plates on one cart. If the cartridge don't fit, you must acquit. <laughs> These are two of the most simple common ways to bypass security with little to no knowledge about hacking. There is the Game Boy Advance with the Supercard, which is a physical game with an SD card port that lets you do countless crazy things on the Game Boy Advance and DS. I remember watching movies on my Nintendo DS and I'm pretty sure I've done it on the Game Boy Advance too. With software mods, they can be done by finding an exploit in a system's architecture and using this exploit to bypass security, which allows hackers to do what they need with the console. Software mods can be temporary or permanent or somewhere in the middle. They call those ones the Malcolm mods. <laughs> Exploiting the console security can be done in very inventive ways and over the years the Wii has had a variety of options. Again I can't even pretend to even begin to understand on a coding level what any of this stuff is, what it takes and what it does. Weebrew.org has a brief breakdown of some of the exploits used on a Wii to access homebrew. Smash Attack requires a copy of Super Smash Bros and works on all Wiis. Indiana Bones. <laughs> it requires a copy of Lego Indiana Jones The Original Adventures and it'll work for NTSC, UNJ and POW Wiis. Yu-Gi-Oh! requires a copy of Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds, Wheelie Breakers. It will only work on Pal Wii's. For NTSC U and J, use Yu Gi Var. Bath Hacks requires a copy of Lego Batman and will work for NTSC U and J and Pal Wii's also. Return of the Jedi requires a copy of the original Lego Star Wars game or the newer 0.1 release NTSC or Pal. Every Hacker Y requires a copy of Tales of Symphonia Dawn of the New World and it will work on NTSC U. J and Pal Wii's. Letterbomb requires no game and will work on any Wii with 4.3. Some of the exploits are done through menus in the games or having an altered save file. On the Wii U to access Homebrew, it was done through a link in the browser, but I prefer it when you don't have to have restrictions of the internet like custom firmware on PSP. Twilight Hack being the first that could be done on the Wii without the use of hardware modification, which required you to play a modified save file. Doing so will enable you to access Homebrew from a file on an SD card. As you can see, some of these exploits require a game, and sometimes it's a popular game like Smash Brothers. This game is fairly popular here. I 
I remember doing 3DS custom firmware and one of the games needed to access the exploit was a really cheap game called Cubic Ninja. The game was really inexpensive. I think it was $3 the day before the hack was announced. Then literally the day of the hack, it went to the moon like Elon Musk tweeted about it. It took years for that price to devalue and still to this day, it's valued at way more than it was ever worth. I thought they said Team Ninja game. What a wasted investment. Can we get 50 garbage trucks in the chat, please? I can't even begin to pretend to understand how these hacks work or how they figured it out, which is why I referenced checking out MVG's video before, because he will break down the technical side of it, making you feel like you fully understand the logistics of all the intricate details. I mentioned in the Pandora's Battery video, a group of hackers reverse engineered a way to get into the PSP service mode, but they didn't have the official tool to do it, but instead they spent years working out with their own intellect and methods. Reverse engineering and homebrew are not illegal practices. That's why a lot of these teams can work out the open the way they do but what crosses the line is how you reverse engineer and what you do when you've succeeded in 2020 a team reverse engineered a pc port of super mario 64 which popped up around the time of the nintendo leaks i remember reading stuff that basically said the team deliberately avoided reading any of the mario 64 code and that nintendo would only have a case against them if they found any code that was similar in their source code rooting and jailbreaking phones isn't illegal either but to root or jailbreak for the purpose of copyright infringement then the piracy part of the act is illegal like with emulation itself it isn't illegal but when you download a pirate game that's when you start to set sail on the seven seas of slightly sneaky r a t e b a y how's my vision did i get 20 out of 20 what 3.14 that's a joke a smart one with hindsight. Because laws are so complicated, I'm talking in general terms. From what I can see, no one wants to go caught over this stuff and make a precedent because when they do, it could go either way. The doors could be open for abuse or closed for those doing legitimate great work from the hacking and homebrew scenes. Modifying the firmware of a phone or console would likely void the product's warranty. But like with most soft mods, it's reversible. So if you have an issue or you need to send it off for physical repair, you're capable of doing that. I'm so happy to see devices come with allow apps from unknown sources and developer options because this gives more control to the customers. I've personally not rooted an Android phone in 10 years, but when I used to use an iPod or other Apple products, I had to jailbreak it because those things just don't serve my needs. Way too restrictive for a consumer like me. I can drag and drop an MP3 on an Android phone and download music from anywhere, but on Apple products, you have to install a proprietary software and transfer it with that i'm not a fan of that i would rather jailbreak the apple device than find some sort of unofficial apps and make the ecosystem friendly to my needs see look at this i've got an ipod touch but how do i turn this thing on again the homebrew channel would allow a user to run unsigned code on the console through this application think of the homebrew channel as a gateway to goodness or a passage to provisions or another something synonym to something synonym <laughs> I spoke about the benefits of running unsigned code on the PSP and the power the Pandora's battery had for the community. The main goal was how it could restore bricked PSPs. There is a similar case with the Wii. A homebrew software you could get was called Boot Me and it could be loaded via the homebrew channel or into the boot which is accessed by holding reset when turning on your console. Which is why when you buy a secondhand Wii, always check if it has this. This would save you so much time from installing homebrew. From Boot Me, you could back up the Wii's NAND which is the system software. So you can have that essentially as a save state for your Wii in case you mess up at any point when you're running these unofficial applications. A lot of this stuff is running unsigned code on a console. And similar with the PSP, it's possible to break your console during this process in many different ways. You just boot up Boot Me and Boot 2 and go back to the NAND you have on your SD card and you flash it to your bricked console. Boot Me has access to other things you can change and manipulate on a console level. It's pretty cool. I know what this Boot 2 NAND flash talk is pretty confusing, so most tutorials are simplified for you with the guide. Bearing in mind that people might need this, but they might not have any clue what they are doing or why. This reminds me of school. They didn't tell me why two plus two is four. They just said minus one, that's three quick maths. Every British person gets told that and how to make tea then put into the real world. These sort of things fascinate me from the homebrew community. They give us the tools to be able to recover our consoles instead of sending them off for repair. It can get pretty confusing and we end up just blindly following guides, not really having a full understanding of the process. But when you even understand this stuff at a basic level, it's really interesting. To install homebrew channel, you need to use the hack me installer. Depending on what firmware you're on, different exploits are needed. But updating to the latest firmware and using the letterbomb exploit by putting the files on your SD card, then accessing the hack me installer through the notifications option is probably the simplest and preferred method. Within the HackMe installer, you'd either choose to install either or both the BootMe and the Homebrew channel. Like with the Pandora's battery story, the goal of the team to get in the Homebrew channel was innocent. And the thing you will see among these guys is they don't want to enable piracy or encourage it. 
They want the community to be able to have freedom with their systems. Hacking a console comes with many benefits as well as challenges for the hackers. And as the generations move forward, security improves and the specs often gives them tools to experiment with. Team tweezers or failover flow have a philosophy. Failover flow has always gone out of their way to make clear the point that they do not support nor want anything to do with piracy or pirates. They are simply a group of hacking enthusiasts who share their work with the community that they played a major part in founding and have made every effort to ensure that their work is not associated with bootlegging. It's commendable work they do but I would be lying if I said I never used Homebrew for anything other than honourable usages. There's a Homebrew browser that allowed you to cycle through the Homebrew apps the community made, which is great. And they can be installed directly from the app, instead of needing to connect the Wii SD card to your PC, then back to your Wii after transfer. A modded Wii has always been one of my favourite video game consoles because of what it's capable of doing. Tweezers had certain intentions of freedom, but I think the pirate side of the freedom is just as fascinating. You can change the console's region, install WADs which allow you to run N64 games which are never put on the virtual console, have emulation from pretty much every console and thousands of ROMs on the SD card. You can even enable backups to run from a burnt disc or USB. Not saying I've done this, but you could borrow a game from a friend or buy it, dump it onto a hard drive connected to your Wii through a homebrew app on the homebrew channel, then return the game. But I also said I'd be lying if I said I never used the homebrew channel for dishonorable things. Hey, the Statue of Limitations didn't get me with the Pandora's battery, so I think I should be fine here too. I also downloaded 10,000 songs on LimeWire. Open up, it's the police. Statue of limitations doesn't apply to newly confessed crimes. Ah! Format the phones, wipe the hard drives, clear the search history, factory reset the Wii, I swallowed the supercard! Oh. Ah, all the pain, all the pain, my belly! But the evidence is gone, blood!